appreciate you tuning in or downloading the podcast. If you're ever available on a Sunday morning, we'd love to have you in person here at the church so that we can shake your hand and awkwardly hug your neck. Uh, but for the rest of us, here's what we're talking about. We are talking about margins, margins in our life. We started 2017. How do you create financial margins? How do you have margin in your schedules? How do we create some moral margin? Why do we need to talk about that? Well, because we believe here at Navigation Church, everybody that's sitting in this chair, uh, in this sanctuary today, those watching online, those downloading podcasts, we are praying that you have the ability, you have the chance, you have an interaction, a providential relationship or connection where you can lead someone to Jesus Christ. And the only way you do that is create some time in your life to do it. If you're running here and there, if you're, if you're, if you're burning the uh, candle at both ends and someone goes, I'm in need, you go, I, do, I need to, I need a little bit more money, I need a little bit more time, I need healthier relationships. Well, guess what? How can you be a life preserver if you're in need of one? So we're talking about how to create margins in our life. Last week, we talked about our scheduled margin. Had two people talk to me after church. It was great. Because one guy said, I'm, it's tough to create schedule in my mar- a margin on my schedule right now because of all the ice that's been coming in. I'm with Amron 14 hours a day. And I said, let me ask you this. Is this elongated time of work all the time or just this time? And he said, well, just this time. I said, see, I don't have a concern about that. Because my wife, when we had a newborn, and she's nursing every two and a half hours and changing diapers, plus taking care of three other kids, her life changed a little bit. And I didn't look at her and go, you didn't wake up an hour early to worship Jesus this morning. How dare you? It's one thing to be in a season. It's another thing to have it a lifestyle. Notice how I used her as an example because (laughs) I have no faults to share of my own. (laughs) Oh, I do. I do. So, so we have to have margins in our schedule to be able to do it. Here's the other thing a, a gentleman that shared with me. He said, I noticed a while back I was driving down the road. How many have ever just briefly went off the side of the road and your car sounded like this? Brrr, those bumps on the side. And he realized those little bumps could have been moved out about two feet. There was a lot of distance on the other side of the bumps because as he was driving with his knee, he needed the ability to kind of have some wiggle room on the road, right? And so, but he kept hitting those bumps, but here's what he realized. If the bumps were as far out as they could, they were the closest point to danger. So our margins should be away from the edge to where even if we hit our margins, we're not falling off a cliff. I went, man, that's a great example to live by. So in, in our schedule, are we creating schedules in our margins the other thing we have to know is that we cannot conform to the today's standard of what schedules should look like. Can, can I say this? When it comes to your money, you need to be abnormal. There's a pastor. You know, there's one thing that Christians want to be known for, being abnormal, right? With the Christianese talk and no one knows what we're talking about. But I promise you this, when it comes to today's culture, you want to be abnormal when it comes to your finances. Because let me ask you this. How many have ever felt stressed because of money? Because of debt, a payment come and due, interest that you're paying. How can, I, I need this, but I'm maxed to my eyeballs, but my tires just fell off the car. The refrigerator just broke. Air conditioner just, just, just uh, um, um, popped out on me. <laughs> That's not the phrase, but I'm not allowed to say the right one. So here's the thing. We need to be abnormal. There it is. You picked it up. We need to be abnormal. So let me tell you about when it comes to the economy of America. You ready for this? When it comes to the economy of America, if you start looking at individual states, I have kind of a map here for you. 2014, California had $2.31 trillion in their economy. That would have made them the eighth largest country in the world, ahead of Italy, Indonesia, or India, and Russia. Our one state in America is, it would have been eighth in the whole world. Texas, second largest, $1.65 trillion, just behind Canada. Illinois, $746 billion ahead of Saudi Arabia and all its oil. That's how big just Illinois' economy is. So guess what, Americans, we have money. But yet, if you look up the US debt clock, when I took this picture on Monday, we owed $20 trillion. That's $61,000 per person, and if you're a taxpayer, you owe debt of $166,000. I'm here to collect it. Uh, Ushers, if you can come. You can't give it on credit card. We need cash, gold, or silver, okay? 
2016 American Household Credit Study. Here's what it looks like. Households have $16,000 plus in credit card debt. That's up 11% in one decade. The average household, ready for the, how, how many would say I want to take a vacation this next year? Okay, if you have $16,000 worth of debt, you're going to pay $1,300 in interest. I just paid for your vacation. You get rid of yesterday's debt for a toy that's now broken and you can enjoy life just a little bit better. But this is American. When you look at the overall debt of the average American, it's, it, it's $130,000 including house mortgages. So I do want to just say this little phrase right here. Our American culture denies, uh, uh, defines happiness as just a little bit more than I have now. In our American culture, I will be happy if I just had a little bit more. So I've given you big numbers, but let me tell you about 210 countries in the world. Americans buy more in trash bags than 90 of those countries spend on everything. Did you guys follow that? Of 210 countries in the world, 90 of them, we spend more on just trash bags then they spend on roads, education, military, food. Their country's entire GOP doesn't even compare to what we as Americans buy in just trash bags. That lets you know the amount of money that we work with. But yet, something crazy happens. By 2004, this is a personal bankruptcy over a 100-year period. And by the way, 2004 is the best long-term thing that I was able to find. So I want to be able to quote that. Back in the 1900s, debt per capita, bankruptcies per capita, was one-tenth of one percent. Almost no one declared bankruptcy. By 1960, it began to grow. Actually, it began to grow by 2004. It was up to 5.3% per capita. And in a four-year period, it grew to 7.6%. Why do we keep getting more and more? Because we have lifestyled ourselves past healthy financial margins. We have to keep up with the neighbors. Can I tell you how easy this is to do? Uh, it, it's, it's pride. Is what it is. So yesterday I was up here with two of my boys and we were working on something and we were walking through one of the rooms and my oldest boy Judah said this, hey daddy, I found a, a, a soda in the fridge. Can I get it? Can I, can I have it? I said, no, that's not ours. And he said, but you're the pastor. You own everything here. <laughs> my wife shaking her head. No, I know the answer. Just give me. <laughs> and I said this, I, I go, son, it, it was weird because inside of me, I wanted to go, yeah, that's right. It, it, but I said to him, I go, son, no, actually, I'm the pastor of Navigation Church, and I'm here to steward everything that God's given me, which was really easy to say because I was preaching on this today. But can I tell you for just, just the briefest a moment, I wanted him to think that. I, I wanted what an eight-year-old thought about me to matter when it came to money, when it came to stuff. And by the way, you can sit there looking with your judgmental eyes but you're gonna go out to a car that you can't afford so when you drive past people you don't know, they think you're successful. So just back it on down there. <laughs> the problem is we actually most likely manage the money that we have according to the way our parents manage their money, but the question I have for you is could the, did your parents manage their money correctly? What is the belief system on money? So I'll tell you this, there's a bil billionaire and hedge fund manager by the name of Paul or John Paulson. He's a billionaire. And he says this, and you can see it on the title of this article, buying a house is still your best investment. How many, uh, I won't do a show of hands, but how many internally right now would go, yes, my house is my best investment. And you would, that's my best investment. So, okay, I, I totally disagree with that. So an investment pays you back, correct? That's what you invest your money in. So what if I tell you this, I need you to invest $100,000 in a stock. And in order to keep that stock, you're going to have to pay property taxes every year. You're going to have to pay insurance, water, gas. You're going to have to do maintenance on the stock. And roughly every year, you're going to have to invest an additional $10,000, ready for this, just to keep it. After 30 years, your stock will probably be worth $100,000. How many go, that's a good investment, I should do that. No, that's not a good investment. An investment is something you put your money out there and you say, money, go to work for me. And when your money comes back, it gives you money back. A house is a liability. 
But all of us in here, a majority of us, some of us in here are going, no, mommy and daddy, the, the school I grew up in, they told me my house is a good investment. No, your house is a necessity. You need to get your house paid for and then all that house payment money, you need to tell it to go to work for you. And maybe buy another house and you're ready for this, move someone else in there. And when they move in there, you know what they'll do? They'll buy your house for you. That sounds like a house going to work for you. But the problem is we live with the belief system that our parents had and we probably manage money the way our parents had. But guess what? It might not be right. It may not be, it might not be correct. Actually, most of us manage money very poorly. And why do I say that? We invest in the lottery. Check out this statistic. We spend $70.15 billion on lottery tickets every year. The next closest thing is sports ticket at 17.8 billion. Actually, add all the bottom ones up, it only comes up to 62.7. When it comes to sports, books, video games, box office, and music, we don't even spend as much as what people spend on lottery. You ready for this? Number one, Dave Ramsey, so I'm allowed to quote him, lottery is a poor person's tax. If you buy lottery tickets, you have a poverty mindset. I love you enough just to say it blunt like that because I'll give you answers on how to fix all this later, but right now I'm just offending you. <laughs> and, and by the way, I will tell you, I, I would hope you strike it rich, but part of me really hopes you don't because you don't know what to do with a million dollars. You will get five years down the road and you'll be worse off than you have now because your poverty mindset's how you're living your lifestyle. And so I don't want you to, okay, so why are we talking about money? Of course, we're at church, the pastor wants our money, right? Isn't that why we come to church? I love it. First time guest, I guess I should have warned you, we're talking about money today. And you go, I was told this church doesn't really talk about money a lot. They just haven't come on the right Sunday. Because <laughs> we are right now. But why are we talking about money? Well, Jesus did. I mean, that's why. So let me ask you, pop quiz, ready for this pop quiz? When it comes to prayer... When it comes to love, when it comes to faith, and what it, when it comes to money, the Bible in whole, what subjects talked about the most? Prayer, of course, it's prayer, right? It's prayer, it's us talking to Jesus and God, and he wants to connect with us, and we want to connect with him. No, no, uh, it's love. After all, in today's society, God is love. He doesn't judge. He isn't righteous. He isn't all those other attributes that clearly are listed. He's love only, you hippies. No, he's not. He's more than that, but... So what if I tell you there's about 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, and over 2,000 verses on money, finances, poor, something like that. Oh, well, that's the whole Bible. You're not talking about Jesus. Pop quiz for you. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to heaven, when it comes to hell, the big three, which one did Jesus talk about the most? Okay, ready for this? He talked about money more than all three of them combined. Money is a huge issue. 13 of the 38 parables have to do with money. Why? Money is a spiritual issue we need to address in our life because if we don't have our money right, you won't have your faith right. And, and, and let me tell you this, God's economy, if we would do what he's told us to do, changes the world. So an article in Revelant Magazine came up a while back, what would happen if churches tithe? Average American only gives 2% of their income to any type of charity. When it comes to people who go to church on a regular basis, 10 to 25%, uh, uh, only 10%, 10 to 25% of any congregation tithes uh, to, to the local church. And I will say that in this church, we have a whole lot of people that are really good tippers. But we probably only have about 25% that are tithers. And I'm not trying to say that in a negative way, it's just stats. It, it's the facts. When, when you kind of look at the giving chart, it's real simple. If someone gave $200, you add a zero, that means they made $2,000 last year. If you only made $2,000 last year, we need to help you. We need to help you find a new job. We need to help you find a new career. We got to get you out of not only poverty, abject poverty. But I've been to your house. I know you didn't make $2,000. So that was awkward because you're going to go, has he been to my house lately? That was a throw off comment. Listen to this. If every person who goes to church right now began tithing 10%, it would add $165 billion to the American churches. $165 billion. If churches gave like this, we could put $25 billion to relieve global hunger, starvations, and death from preventable diseases in the next five years. 
$12 billion could eliminate illiteracy in the next five years. $15 billion when it comes to water uh, sanitation, places where people are only making a dollar a day, we could solve that need now. $1 billion would fund every overseas missions. And by the way, the local churches in America would still have somewhere between 100 and $110 billion to do something here. If people just tithed, if everybody did what God had called them to, I, man, the energy in this place right now is just through the roof. <laughs> There's so much, like I can feel the waves of excitement hitting you because here, here's what happened. I brought up money today and, and, and you're thinking we're about to receive a big offering. You know, we have the building up for sale. He's going to tell us we found someplace. We found land. We found a building. He's about to tell us about a giving campaign that's three years and long. And we're, we, we got to raise $1.8 billion, million, dollars, billion, I'll take it, $1.8 million. And, and I want to tell you this, that no, there's no big offering today. There's no big push for anything. I am to t here to tell you this. That in my mind, as I've been studying today's service, and I hope I'm not like dumbing you down because of the way my brain thinks, but I asked the props department to put something together for me. And when I say props department, you remember when I said my, me and my boys were up here last night? There's openings in the props department. You know what? We, <laughs> as pastors, we always say there's departments so that we're bigger because pride tells us you got to own everything, right? So, so here, here's what's happening. I'm here to tell you, when it comes to your money, you cannot be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ if your money's not right. It's not about receiving an offering today. It's not about telling you you have to give more. It's not about telling you that you, you're not being faithful to the call that God's given. Here's what I'm here to tell you. You cannot be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ if your money is turned upside down, mixed up, mismanaged, if you haven't mastered it. Why? Because as I've been studying this week, I've been getting this little picture that, the again, the props department put together with empty vitamin bottles. So <laughs> as you read scriptures, it's almost like there's a little chair on your heart. And only one person is allowed to sit on that chair at a time. It's either going to be your money or it's going to be God. It's either going to be the one with your mouth you say you love the most or it's going to be the one you go to work for all the time. What do you mean go to work for my money? If you're in debt, you have to go to work. Your money owns you. That's, I mean, that's the facts. If you don't believe me, don't go. And then call the IRS and just let them know, I don't owe you anymore. That'll work out well. <laughs> See, see, here's the thing. We think we can look at everything that Jesus said because Jesus is the center of my life, but we can ignore half of what his teachings were all about, and it's still okay. It doesn't work like that. Because if I said to you right now, are you a follower of Jesus Christ, fully devoted to him, but yet you know that there's someone sitting right next to you that you hate? Oh, and by the way, they're a Christian too. Because that jerk did this to me. I'm never going to forgive him. I could care less about him. If his life goes down in tragedy, if her life goes down in flames, I could absolutely care less. I have a question. Would anyone go, no, that's a good Christian? he go, no, you got to get that fixed. Because if this ain't right, that won't be right. And if this ain't right, you'll never worry about this. And so here's the thing. As much as God talked about that, he talked about money sitting on the throne of your heart a whole lot more. And so I kept seeing this picture of who's going to sit on your heart? Who's going to sit on this? And when it says this, why is this? Matthew 6, 21 says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This isn't an opinion. This isn't a good thought. This is fact. Where your money goes, your heart follows. How many right now know about the com uh, company Fun Fidgets LLC? Nobody does doesn't exist but for this scenario it does <laughs> let me ask you this you don't care about them your heart's not invested in them what if we took ten thousand dollars out of your checking savings whatever account and invested it in their stocks do you care about them now do you see that little ticker tape go by and you want to look at the three little digit code that you know is theirs and you want to see if it's green or red every day just sitting on the side of your Y? Because all of a sudden you're meant there, your money went there, you just stole a little piece of your heart went with it. And now if all of our heart is attached to little pieces of debt all around us, we have a fragmented heart 
and all the places where our money's mismanaged. And how can you say, I am fully devoted to Jesus Christ? You can't be fully devoted to Christ because your heart's in 32 little pieces scattered all over here called debt, loans, mortgages, cars, toys. You cannot be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ if your heart is everywhere like this. And Jesus tells this, it says, Luke 16, verse 13, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one, love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and the devil, right? Because if Jesus was going to talk about two people to serve, devil's it. Oh, back in the day, I'm sorry, I admit, can't serve both God and Baal. You can't serve both God and Pervert. No, it's actually you can't serve both God and money, money, money. Thank you, Pink Floyd. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to. I'd like to point a little something out right now. I haven't gotten an amen since I've started this fantastic <laughs> sermon. <laughs> I actually, here, here's what happened. Here, here's what happened. Some of you. I'm just going to kind of point this out. The moment we started talking about finances. You dimmed me down just a little bit. That should be a telltale sign of who's sitting on your heart. Amen. Some of you have your finances correct, so your finances are subservient to the Christ you serve and the heart that's sent fully to him. So if you're sitting here now going, that pastor has no, he has no right to be talking about me or my money. Uh, it kind of gives you an indicator which master you're serving. What do you mean, which master am I serving? Jesus knows the number one thing that's in competition for your heart isn't a place, isn't a person, it's things. And the world around us tells us this. We believe our self-worth is established in our net worth. But I want to tell you today, through Christ, you have value without your valuables. You have values you are valuable. You don't have to keep buying clothes and keep buying a bigger house and keep buying a faster car and keep buying the bigger, better, latest, greatest thing in order to show the world around you that you have value. Guess what? The greatest margin that you can have in your life is a financial margin not to buy more stuff for you, but so that you can provide for others. And you provide for others depending on who's sitting on your heart. So Jesus knew that the heart of the problem would be the problem with our heart. The number one competition that we're going to have here is that if our heart is divided in little pieces all over the place, there's no way that we can be fully committed to be followers of Jesus Christ. Actually, here's, here's the things he was really afraid for. Yeah, Proverbs 22, 7 it says, The rich rule over the poor and the borrower, ready for this word? Slave to the lender. I'm not a slave to Jesus Christ. Actually, I desire to be a slave to Jesus Christ. Whole lot of New Testament passages. New, New Testament, by the way, it's, it, it's when Jesus shows up, there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. Uh, uh, kind, of the, kind of the books that came before Jesus and the books after. After the books that came for Jesus, they still use the word slave. Because we were never meant to be God of our own life. We were always meant to have a God on our life, for our life. And Jesus is really afraid that if you get really interested in money, that that interest in the money will end up capturing your heart. Jesus knew that if you continue to divide your heart in month, mortgage payments, monthly payments, credit card payments, loans, debt, uh, uh, um, uh, college loans, all those things, you would divide your heart in all these different places and you never have your heart in one place because Jesus, you ready for this? I, I, you may not believe this, but I, I promise you this is true. Jesus is not interested in your money. Jesus is interested in capturing your heart. Ready, ready for this thought for you? The entire time Jesus was on earth talking, he never once asked people for money. Actually, correction, he did one time. He was doing an example. He said, does anybody have a coin? Someone pulled out a coin and handed it to Jesus. Jesus told his example. Then you ready for this? He pocketed it and said, sucker. Where'd it go? I mean, Jesus could do those things. He walked on water. Why not make a man <laughs> disappear, right? No, no, no. no. He, he did his example. Then he handed it back. Because Jesus knew this. Jesus was willing to talk about the spiritual issue called money. We think, and I'm sorry 
that if you believe the church, I'm sorry if you kind of grew up with the mentality, we need more money, we need more money. We need. Now, I can tell you this. As a church, I've tried calling Ameren, who pay, is our electric company. I said, hey, we're a church. We appreciate the free electricity. And I bless you today. Are we even? We square? I had to call, like, they didn't take that phone call. So guess what? The church does need money to run. The church does need money to function. But here's what we can't do. We can't be in debt like the world is. We can't run up to our eyeballs and, and, and not have any margin be able to bless people around us. We, we have to plan just a little bit different. Because if we don't fully have our money as a master, if we haven't fully mastered our money, we will become a servant to our money. So Jesus only talked about money the one time. He was willing to talk about that spiritual issue, but he also knew this. He had a dirty little secret that none of us want to face. First Chronicles 29. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. Ready for this line? Everything in heaven and earth is yours. So I'm about to give you guys, no one's told you this before in your life, but you have to hear it. This is going to come and you may gasp for air. When you hear the level of revelation I'm about to dole out to you. One day you're going to pass away. That was it. That was it. There was no... I guess I can add this too. Um, when you die, everything stays here. Oh, and here's the next thought. So does God. Like, we're here for, what, 80, 60, 70, 80, 90, 120 years, whatever that number seems to be. But we pass away, and guess what? It's still here. Him. It's his, everything under earth. But the problem is we think we own it. We think it's ours and we manage it like it's ours. We don't steward it like it's somebody else's. But if we steward money like it was someone else's, then guess what? Money may be around our heart, but it's still subservient to our king. It's still subservient to our Lord. And most of the time, if you would think of money like your hotel versus your home. See, most of us manage our money like we do when we go to hotel rooms. When you go to a hotel room, how many go ahead and get a clean towel every single day because your glorious body deserves it? <laughs> I mean, that is a high running temple you got going on there. So you get it. How many, you leave the hotel room and you go ahead and leave the lights on, maybe the air conditioning cranked all the way down because your wife's not with you and you can finally have it as cold as you want? Or is this just, am I the only one that does this? Okay, okay. When you go home, I bet you use your towel two, three, four, five times. I bet you it can walk away from you at times. And how many get that smell? You wipe, you clean, you go, oh man, I got that. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't do that at the hotel, but you may do that at your own house. Why? Because when it's yours versus someone else's, you manage it completely different. In our money, is it God's or is it ours? Because if we view it as something that we're stewarding it, like our house, like our towel, guess what? We're going to manage that a whole lot different than the hotel that you can go. And I'm going to throw the trash towards the trash can. Almost made it. I'll get that later. No, I'm just kidding. She will when they come through. And I, and I put the sign up that says absolutely clean it. Because if I don't have a turned down bed when I get back, that's hypocrisy, right? Like that's how we're going to live that life. But the reality is that's not how you live at home. Because one of it you're using, one of it you own. Let me ask you this. How many of you own your kids? Not when they're, I'm, I'm talking about in general, you own your kids. Even me saying that, you kind of go, you're not allowed to say you own your kids. Absolutely, you don't own your kids, but you have ownership of them for a season. You steward them, you train them up, you raise them up, but eventually they go out on their own. What if I tell you you shouldn't have too much, your mindset with money shouldn't be too much more different than that? It's not yours. We're here to steward it. After all, everything belongs to God. So we, we have, Jesus knew this, that when it comes to the spiritual issue of money, he is in competition with money, with, uh, uh, with, with desires, with, with your flesh. He'll always be in competition with that. But Jesus wasn't interested in just getting your money. He was always interested in capturing your heart. And so Jesus himself, more than half the times that he taught, or about half the times that he taught, he talked on the principles of finances. Why? And, and, and I know you're here, if you've never been to church before, you've only been to church a few times, you're thinking, here comes the ask, here comes the offering. He's going to pass the buckets in a second. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you something you might not have thought of before. 
Jesus' desire is that you are not overrun with the stress of finances. Jesus desires, God, God wants you to be free from the pressures of going to work and making the next payment and you got to get the next step. He wants you to be free from the desire that money keeps encroaching onto your little heart here. I have a question. I have a question. If I was, if I was outside with my boys right now and all of a sudden I look on the back of the fence and then coming out of the back of the fence, a, a dog, a lion, a bear, who a, a cheetah, an aardvark, who cares, right? The, but clearly this cougar, this panther, this tiger that's in Illinois is coming out of the back of the fence, having their, my, their, its eye on my kids. I have a question as a father, how loud do you think I'm screaming? How fast do you think I'm running? What am I going to do to stop them from being attacked by this thing? Anything in the world, right? Jesus did the same thing for you with your natural finances. He screamed and he goes, guys, it's going to rule you. It's going to overtake you. It's going to sit on the throne of your heart. And I'm telling you now, you have to manage money before your ma money manages you. You guys have to hear me. I desire for you to be free. The reason we have to talk about money in the church, the reason we have to have this conversation is you're not free to be who you're supposed to. You're not free to give your full heart to Jesus Christ because someone else owns it. It's a mortgage company. It's your visa card. It's your car that you can't afford. You are its slave. And Jesus is going, listen, I don't want you to be a slave for anybody else. I want to be the lover of your soul. Actually, you know, we're talking about this in a very practical way. But can I tell you, he did this both practically as well as spiritually. He said he did this both physically as well as eternity, eternally for you. You know, here on earth, you may be able to pay down some payments. But there was a spiritual payment that you owed that you could not pay. And maybe this might be the first time you're hearing this. And I, I, I have a desire just to share this with you. I, and, and, a, and just give me three minutes and I want to give you five practical steps if you're struggling with your finances. But if you're here this morning and you think, oh, we're talking about finances. We're talking about finances. We're talking about finances. No, no, no. Here's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about your heart. Who does your heart belong to? Does your heart belong to your stuff? Does your heart belong to your toys? Does your heart belong to your, the attractions that you want to go to? Or does your heart belong to Jesus? And I'm going to appeal to you in this way. I believe that it should belong to Jesus. Why do I say that? Number one, he taught a lot of principles. You ready for this? We, we could preach three months straight on the principles just Jesus taught and never repeat ourselves. That, that's how much he taught on those principles. So naturally you could be free. But do you know what? You also have a debt in the spirit that you couldn't pay. And here's what it is. You've sinned. You know, there's been actions in your life. And I don't know if you know this, or, but maybe you've felt this before. Have you ever done something where right after you've done it, you kind of felt dirty inside, dark inside? Uh, here's a word for you. How many have ever had a regret? You probably have a regret because you transgress somebody, right? Do you like those big words? Yeah, there, there's one for you. So there, there's probably someone that you talked to wrong, you stole from, you, 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 you offended them. And when you transgress, and I know that's the word you might not be used to, but you live with that regret and inside of you, you're just feeling dark. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, listen, I need to deliver these sermons personally to everybody. He sat on a heavenly throne. We knew about him because of this Old Testament that I was explaining earlier, but we didn't know him personally. So Jesus stepped out of heaven, walked on earth, clothed himself in flesh, just like you. It was, you and, it was us. But the difference was the debt of sin that we owed, he could actually pay for it. But not only did he pay for it, he paid for it so that every heart could know him and every heart could spend eternity with him. So before I tell you practically how to take care of some natural debt that you have, I want to tell you how to take care of some spiritual debt that you might have. And if you've never said to Jesus, I have sinned, I have transgressed, <laughs> I have a debt on my life that I cannot pay, but Jesus, I didn't know you loved me this much. I've always been taught church is all about your money. No, no, church will talk about money because it's the biggest spiritual issue your heart's going to face. And Jesus is interested in your heart. Jesus is interested in you loving him more than anything. So can we do this before we 
talk about just a couple really quick practical tools that you can use as far as to get out of debt. I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads. And God, as I've been talking here in just the last five minutes, just explaining the spiritual debt that we owe. If there's anybody in here that is sitting there going, yes, I have spiritual debt. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I don't know him to be one that has paid this bill for me. And I want to be free from I want to be free from the guilt, the shame. I want to be guilt free from the sleepless nights and the pressures that I've been feeling in the life around me. If you're here this morning and you would say, you know what, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have a debt. I know that I've never turned my life over to Jesus. And when you say who's sitting on the throne of your heart, I know it's anything but God. But this morning, there's something happening inside of you right now. There's almost an excitement. And if you would say, I want Jesus to be at the center of my life, could you do me a favor? Just no one's looking right now. Could you just slide your hand up in the air so that we can see? Thank you very much. There's one person, there's two that have raised their hand. Three. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you that you care for their hearts. I thank you that some people would think this is a difficult conversation, but it's not today because you are at the center of capturing hearts. So I'm going to ask this. Could we all say this prayer with me? Jesus, Jesus. I repent of my sins and I am sorry for the debt that I've collected eternally but today I accept your payment on my behalf and I pray that for eternity you sit on the throne of my heart you know, the scripture says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you're saved. So can I get to everyone to open their eyes, pick their heads up, and celebrate with those that have made a decision today to thank you, Jesus. Love it, love it, love it. So right after church, I want to make sure to connect with you. I want to connect with anyone who raised their hand today. But can, we're going to talk practical and we're going to fly through this. If you need these points, make sure to go to our website, go to the podcast and re-download it. Point number one that I want to tell you tomorrow, what you decide today, you will see tomorrow. Set a direction. When it comes to your finances, you will use it or you will be used by it. Do you need to intentionally make a change in your life when it comes to your finances? If so, step number two, break the power of money. When you live for your money, it becomes your master. When you give your money, it becomes your servant. So if you go, how do I break the power of money in my life? Give. You have to. Oh, there it is. There's the pastor. He's giving you. Here comes the offering. He's about. No, no, no. I'm telling you. You work for your money right now. You tell your money to go to work for you. And you find a way to give. And if you go, I'll, here's one for you. If you're really struggling right now and you think I'm talking about giving to Navigation Church, give somewhere. Find a charity. Send it to another church. I don't care. What I care is for you to no longer have the conviction, or, or be under the condemnation, no longer to be under the pressure, under having money sit on your throne. Give. Now, I think giving to Navigation Church is really a good thing to do. Why? Because we're doing really good things. But I'd rather you get the pressure off of you thinking I'm manipulating you to give and give to something. Give somewhere. Number two, make a list. This is Financial Peace University. If you don't know what I mean by make a list, I have no more time. My margins in my schedule has absolutely ran out. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace University. It's a multiple week course where they process you through. They mentor you through what to do. And they say, make a list. Your smallest debts to your biggest debts and you just start paying stuff off. If you're here today and you go, you know what? I need someone to mentor me. I need a life coach when it comes to my finances. At the end of service, just go back to the Connection Center. Actually, just about everybody's going to be going to Connection Center today. When I get done with announcements, you're going to freak out. How many, how many of you have to go back there? God bless them. I warned them ahead of time. But we need extra volunteers today. Sign up now. Or sign up for the props department. I don't care. So, but if you say, I need someone to coach me in this, we just finished a Financial Peace University course. But if there's enough people that need this one-on-one -on -one mentoring or group mentoring, we'll run it again so that you can get free from the wrong thing sitting on the throne of your life. Number two, ready for this? If you're a businessman or woman, I'm going to help you out here. 
If your books aren't balancing, reduce spending or increase income. I don't have enough money. Stop spending so much. Or, ready for it? Make more. But I promise you, if you're spending more than you're making now, you can make more. You ready for this prophecy? You'll spend more. So you got you to get to sit. Next thing, resist impulses. Ready? We practiced this last week. We're going to practice it again this week. No. Can, I need you to say it with me. Tongue, tongue, not. No. We have a rule at the house, and it's pretty much my rule, and it drives my kids, my wife, everybody. Mariah can't even talk, drives her nuts. They walk through a store. How many have ever walked through? It's amazing. Kids are in the cart, and you get to the end, and you're like, how'd all this stuff get in the carts? They have nine foot arms for a two foot kid. It's crazy. So we have this rule. If you remember it tomorrow, we'll buy it. It is amazing. Out of sight, out of mind, people forget because it's an impulse buy. Learn how to say that. Ready for me? No. It will do you good. God, I thank you for today. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for spending so much time on the greatest competitor that keeps us from loving you. Thank you from the greatest thing that keeps you from sitting on the throne of our lives. So today, God, we choose that you will sit on our throne. You will sit on our heart. You, God, will be the master we serve. And all these other places where materialism tries to sneak its way in, Lord, help us see it for what it is. And it's the enemy crouching at the door to take a seat that's rightfully yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.